Ryan Adams here, naturalweightlossmastery.com, vegan, slim, and sustain.com. Time to bust some myths today. Some of you believe that you're not losing weight on a vegan plant-based diet because you're eating too many avocados. You heard all the fat was bad for you, and it's because you're eating avocados and some nuts and seeds that you're not losing weight. Some of you think because you're not doing the 50-50 plate, that's why you're not do losing weight, excuse me. I'm about to prove to you why those thoughts and beliefs are absolutely incorrect and show you exactly why you're not losing weight and what to do to actually remedy that. Busting some myths today, giving you some clear actionable instructions on exactly what to do next to get that scale finally moving. Let's jump in. Here's the intro. I'll be right back. Thank you ever so much to those of you joining me live. I gave no notice for this, so it's very, very impromptu, so there won't be many of you. Thank you also to those catching the replay. First of all, then, let's get this myth busting out of the way. I want to make clear here, you are not overweight right now because of the following. Number one, you eat too many carbs. Number two, you eat too much fat. All this debate about the macronutrients. Number three, you eat too much fruit now that you've gone vegan. All of a sudden, all this fruit in your diet. Veggies as well, but all this fruit. What about those sugars? Is that really good for you? Is that really good for weight loss? Could that be holding me back? Number four, you eat too many fake meats and cheeses, vegan cheese products, all those vegan alternatives, the vegan creamers instead of milk creamer, so on and so forth, dairy etc etc you are not overweight because of any of these four things now there are exceptions to the rule and there is sort of an asterisk and a caveat that i'm going to put on and later in the live stream if we've got time i'll circle back to the exceptions on those things but people are blown away when they hear this stuff oh, okay isn't it isn't it the sugars isn't it the fat isn't it the carbs some people thinking it's about the macronutrients some people thinking it's one ingredient in their diet like the fruit component fruit is just one of many five or six seven arguably different food groups under the whole foods plant-based umbrella so the idea that fruit is the only thing and the only reason why you're not losing weight right now completely incorrect but these are the beliefs that you may have i don't mean sound patronizing or condescending i've been there myself when the scale isn't budging, you come to all kinds of conclusions, whether sensible or not. But I want to make clear here, these are not the reasons why you're overweight right now. The real reason, in fact, of course, drumroll please, why you're overweight, most likely, and again, exceptions to the rule, but most likely is because you're consuming too many calories. I know, calories boring, boring, boring is what everyone talks about all the time. And you left the mainstream health world and that ridiculous diet merry-go-round because you don't want to hear about calories anymore. But the arrogance, the audacity of many of my fellow admittedly vegans and plant-based dieters who merely assume that not eating animal products anymore, regardless of what they're eating, not eating animal products anymore, that they will simply fly down the scale without ever having to worry about calories, without ever having to consider macronutrient profiles, macronutrient ratios, without ever having to consider fiber content and the vitamin and mineral, the nutrient profile of foods, without ever having to consider the important principle of caloric density. Wow, the arrogance, the audacity in that. It must end, and I'm here to wake my fellow vegans and plant-based dieters up about this. The sheer arrogance and ignorance about the subject of calories in the vegan plant-based community constantly to this day baffles me and surprises me. And I get it. I've been there. I've served my time with calorie counting for two years, 18 months to two years. Pretty religiously, I was counting my calories every single day. And yes, it drove me bonkers. Yes, it definitely worsened my relationship with food. Yes, I started to think about food in such a quantitative manner that I forgot about its qualitative aspects, you know, being a nourish, a source of nourishment, you know, nutrient richness, diversity, so on and so forth. When you think about the calories and the macros all day, yes, it does drive you bonkers. When you try and squeeze things into your diet to make your calories work, yes, it does, does drive you bonkers. I'm not here to propose that you need to count calories for the rest of your life. That's what I've been able to get away from with thanks to this amazing plant-based methodology. But still, two things can coexist.
You cannot have to count calories every day, but acknowledge simultaneously that calories are still important. They, those two things can both coexist, believe it or not. It isn't some binary thing where just because you don't have to count calories, that means you don't have to consider calories. Those are not one and the same. So the real reason you're overweight most likely, again, there are exceptions to the rule, long-term under eaters. Maybe some people are eating in a decent caloric range, but the quality of their food is not so good. Maybe some people don't have quite the right macronutrient profile and just switching things up slightly at the same caloric amount will yield to some fat loss. Again, there are exceptions to the rule, but generally speaking across the board, if you're not losing weight right now, nine times out of 10, it's because you're eating too many calories for your requirements overall. So for now, my call to action, stop worrying about carbohydrates versus fat, that whole debate, playing the macronutrients off against one another. Stop worrying about how much protein in your diet. Stop worrying about, am I eating too much fruit? That's not to say all of these questions aren't useful and valid. These are questions that should be answered, right? Protein matters. Matters. You know, the difference between carbohydrates and fat and how they make up your diet, they still do matter. These questions still matter, but your first step is to make sure that you're in a sensible calorie deficit, step number one. Now that's cleared up, and now we've really got to the heart of what is actually going to get the scale moving and got through all of the debate about things that do matter, but frankly, things that are semantics and secondary compared to simply being in a calorie deficit in the first instance. Now we've got that out of the way, let's clear up the two main reasons why you're probably not in a calorie deficit right now, or and or you're struggling to actually be in one, because these are really important. Once you identify that you need to be in a calorie deficit, there's many of you that already know this, you might be struggling to actually consistently do so. So let's break down exactly why. Well, reason number one, actually, I suppose, is that you don't actually realize that you're not in a calorie deficit. So you're hearing what I'm saying here, and you're either having the epiphany of, oh yeah, that makes so much sense. Uh, just because I'm vegan, that doesn't mean I get to forget about calories. They're still important. That's the epiphany you might well be having. Uh, number two is, oh, I've heard that all before, Ryan, but I didn't actually quite realize the importance of it. I understand this whole calorie thing. I've heard it before, but maybe I just sort of slightly lost sight of the importance of it. Or maybe I do know the importance of it, but I'm not actually paying that much attention or mindfulness to calories. One of those things. But bottom line, you don't actually realize perhaps that you're not in a calorie deficit. Deficit. In other words, it's an awareness issue. Okay, you understand the point about calories, perhaps, but you don't realize that you're not in a calorie deficit every day. Or you do understand that you're not in a calorie deficit every day and you're really struggling to actually be in one. We'll, we'll come on that shortly. So that's reason number one why you're not in a calorie deficit right now. You didn't actually realize until this conversation, until conversation, until this uh, this video. It's a, it's a monologue, sadly, for you guys, but until this conversation. Reason number two why you're not in a cal de calorie deficit is you do understand the importance of calorie deficits and you might even be in one sometimes, but you find being in a deficit hard to sustain. Maybe you find it easy to sustain Monday to Friday, but the weekends trip you up. That's a common um, a cliche, as cliche for a reason, but that's a common uh, meme that I suppose I run into with my clients all the time. So which one applies to you? I suppose that's the question. Is it reason number one or number two? Is it just awareness and therefore perhaps just, again, hearing about the importance of calories can now give you some inspiration to go and actually place some emphasis on them? Or is it you actually have heard it, you actually understand everything I'm saying here. It's actually a little bit boring to you. I'm maybe a broken record on the calorie subject, but you're just struggling to actually stay in one consistently. Which is it for you? For anyone watching in the chat, you can always let me know, obviously. Um, and this is where we're now going to get into our solutions. Once you've actually identified the reason you're not in a calorie deficit, let's get into solutions. So if it's an awareness problem, here's what I want you to do right now. You'll need to work out, and this is daunting for people, but I'm going to break it down step by step, so stick with me. You'll need to work out approx approximately how many calories you're currently eating daily right? And this is going to be a really illuminating task for many of you. Many of you have never done this before. Some of you have done this years and years ago. But right now, to be able to take what you consider to be a weight loss friendly diet, maybe lots of these plant foods, and actually put them into a calorie calculator, this could go one of two ways. You could actually think, oh, I'm not actually eating that many calories. But for many of you perhaps watching this video, given the title of this video, you might actually be surprised. You might be thinking, oh, but I thought I could eat as many whole foods as I wanted. And I thought I could just sort of prescribe to this just eat plants motto and I would be at the right amount of calories or I would automatically lose weight. And that is that audacity and that arrogance 
that I, was, that I was pretty blunt on earlier on. You cannot just eat plants. Like a lot of you, you, you're not losing weight right now under this guise of just eat plants. You're not going anywhere. You need to look more deeply. You need to do this analysis. You need to think about calories. You need to think about uh, then as an extension of that macronutrients, but we're just on the calories today. So if it's reason number one and it's awareness issue and you have no idea how many calories you're consuming or this is your first time hearing about the importance of calories again, what you need to do is be aware of how many you're actually consuming. How? You can download free nutrition tracking apps like my fitness pal. You've heard me talk about. That's what I used to use back in the day, bringing back nostalgic, not so pleasant, but nostalgic memories. Chronometer is a really, really popular one with much nicer visuals. My fitness pal is very, I find my fitness pal actually easier to use, but Chronometer has got beautiful layouts and graphs, and it's nice to see all your data there if you're a bit of a data geek like I can sometimes be. But my fitness pal, Chronometer, there are other free nutrition tracking services and apps out there. Track everything you eat for three days. Now, it's important to stress that you want these three days to be indicative of how you usually eat. You don't want to do three days where you're being purposely really, really tight and strict with your nutrition. I want you to be tight and strict with your nutrition anyway, but you don't want to do necessarily those three days if that isn't really a fair reflection of how you eat. Uh, on the adverse, you don't want to do three days where you're on vacation or it's Easter coming up or you do it over the holidays or whatever when your diet is actually totally you know, out of sync from what it usually is. So do three of your average days, try and fairly track your calories and see where you come out. Then take those sorts of figures. You can do an average between the three day or just take that ballpark figure that you get for those three days because they should be relatively consistent. Then use a BMR calculator on Google. Uh, omnicalculator.com has a decent one. Once more, that's omnicalculator.com. But use a BMR calculator on Google to compare your recommended calorie intake as per the calculator to your actual intake from this little three-day experiment you've done. And you'll immediately get some answers in three days' time. You'll immediately be able to see the difference, see where you might be going wrong. And a lot of you, I guarantee when you do this exercise, if you actually do this exercise and challenge yourself on this, um, if I can hold you to account on this, you will actually be surprised at how many calories, calories you're consuming, despite a large percentage of your diet, I'm sure, or I hope being uh, at least whole foods, you will be amazed. Ah, okay, yeah, I'm eating very cleanly, I'm very eating very healthily, but maybe I haven't been that intentional about my calories and that's why I'm not losing weight. These are some of the conclusions that many of you will come to. So that's reason number one. If it was an awareness problem, that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna get my fitness pal, just to recap, you're gonna get chronometer, you're gonna do your three-day experiment, then you're gonna compare um, to your BMR calculator, what that's suggesting for you uh, at maintenance calories. And you're going to see, now I'm not talking about weight loss calories, by the way, I'm just talking about comparing to your maintenance and you're going to be able to instantly see where it is that you are going wrong. If it's reason number two, so remember, you need, you know, reason number two is you know you need to be in a calorie deficit, but you find it difficult to sustain. You need to make, and I talk about this all the time, but you need to make being in a sensible calorie deficit as easy as possible. That's basically the key to lasting weight loss. How can I stay in a non-aggressive calorie deficit as easily as possible? If you actually just sit down now and ask yourself that question, you will come up with all kinds of help, helpful solutions. I'm gonna share with you with some now, but people don't do this level of troubleshooting. They just get the diet plan, they get their exercise program, or that's actually one step ahead of where most people are. Most people just sort of wing it and throw some mud at the wall and, oh, what am I gonna eat for breakfast today? Oh, this apparently is good for weight loss, I'll see what happens. And uh, again, I don't mean to sound, sound condescending, we all start somewhere. Um, but you need to actually sit down, ask yourself, right, how can I make losing weight as easy as possible. So here are a couple of ideas. Number one, and again, you'll be aligned with me on this. You won't be on my channel otherwise. Number one, you want to follow a volume eating based approach. By volume eating, give this a Google, but volume eating, we're playing a volume game. We're trying to eat voluminous food that contains few calories so we can eat generously and still lose weight at the same time. Big portions. The amount of my clients, I would say it's over 50% who write to me after the first week of my program or during the first week of my program and say, wow, Ryan, I cannot believe how much food you're letting me eat is unbelievable. I will actually every now and again have maybe one in 10 clients that actually says, Ryan, it's actually way too much food. I can't even finish this, even though calorically it's totally appropriate for them and they are losing weight, right? And this is just, isn't this the antithesis of that sort of eat less food, move more, right? That just 
Just eat less food. Or you want to lose weight, just eat less food. No, you don't have to eat less food. You might have to eat fewer calories, but not necessarily less food volume. And the amount of my clients that report back to me that they're just loving and just amazed by how much food they can eat and still lose weight at the same time is mind-blowing. This was one of the epiphanies for me. So we want to follow a volume-eating-based approach. So we're thinking about lots of fruits, lots of veggies. And of course, this doesn't mean we're doing a 50-50 plate or only eating fruits and veggies or doing something like Nutritarian, which is a, a very much a, a micronutrient focus. Um, approach because I don't agree with those things necessarily either um, or to do them exclusively. I don't agree necessarily exclusively with a raw vegan diet. That's a volume eating based approach, but we're using elements of this volume eating philosophy. Does that make sense? That's what I want you to employ here if you want to make being in a calorie deficit as easy as possible. So lots of fresh fruits and veggies to add bulk, lots of potatoes, tubers, so sweet potatoes, yams, white potatoes. These are really, really amazing for adding bulk with very few calories. I always talk about white and sweet potatoes being some of the best or the best argument weight loss foods on the planet because of their amazing intersection between calorie content and um, uh, satiation effect. Unbelievable. The amount of food you get, the amount of fullness you can get from eating a white potato, especially more so than sweet potato, white potato for so few calories is absolutely mind blowing. So volume eating based approach. Um, whole grains, these are a little bit higher in terms of caloric density. Beans, a little bit higher in terms of caloric density. A few nuts and seeds, they're really high in caloric density. But again, they're a much smaller percentage of your diet. Generally, we're focused on these low calorie density foods to bulk up. My clients, they send me the photos all the time in their first week when we do our accountability food photos for the first seven days. And they're having, you know, they're, they're loving those snacks. And it's just amazing. You compare one of those, you know, supposedly healthy protein bars, you know, or some some protein bars are healthy, by the way, but, you know, many of these health bars, not so much. You compare one of these, even take a Lara bar. Lara bars are really clean. I eat Lara bars fairly regularly. They are a very clean health bar. However, the size of a Lara bar for about 200 to 210, 215 calories versus a big bowl of, of grapes or strawberries, berries, uh, or a banana um, and an apple, like my clients get to eat for their afternoon snack. Like it's just f for comparatively the same or even fewer calories. The volume difference is absolutely startling. So this is where a volume eating based approach makes it really easy to be in a calorie deficit. Second thing you want, if you want to make it easy to be in a calorie deficit, is you're going to eat lots of low calorie density food. So you can eat big for relatively few calories. I've kind of already lumped that into volume eating. I sort of got carried away and I've done both in one. So I don't need to repeat myself on that. Number three, you're prioritizing whole plant foods um, over those calorie dense processed vegan foods. I think this is again fairly obvious to my audience at this stage, but some of those vegan meat alternatives and vegan processed foods, some are better than others. Admittedly, some of them can still be consumed on a, on a weight loss friendly diet. Absolutely. Again, if the calories are appropriate, but I'm not saying completely exclude those things. I'm just saying prioritize whole foods because they're going to give you the most satiation for the fewest calories. They're going to give you, generally speaking, the biggest nutrient profile for the fewest calories. So focusing on those is going to create a level of fullness and satiation that you're going to be find it much harder to get from lots of processed foods in the diet. And finally, number four here is, again, lots of overlap with all these things. This is going to make it really easy to be in a calorie deficit, fiber. Focusing on fiber rich foods, which fiber is not hard to come by on a whole foods plant based diet. You guys know this already, but our legumes, our whole grains, our vegetables and fruits, really easy to get enough plenty of fiber. So much so that some people actually, when they transition to this way of eating, they actually get objectively too much fiber for what their digestion and sadly bowel movements initially at least can handle. But fiber is amazing both directly and indirectly. Not only has fiber got many wonderful properties from a health and weight loss perspective, we're thinking gut bacteria, its role in terms of inflammation, which is uh, strongly associated with obesity, so on and so forth. Not only fiber itself seems to be really, really important for weight loss, but so indirectly as well, because so many fiber rich foods foods also have a low caloric density and come stuffed with loads of other great nutrients as well. So both directly and indirectly, fiber is incredible. Amazing. And I can't remember to mention this for keeping you fuller for longer as well. So again, one of the things my clients report back is with all this fiber in their diet, the level of fullness, even if they're eating way less calories than what they were prior to me when they're eating all the vegan junk stuff, the fiber just allows them to feel so full for so long to the extent that as I say, every now and again, I'll get a client write to me saying, Ryan, I had lunch six hours ago. Um, I, in my mind, I'm like, I should probably have dinner now. It's getting to seven or eight. This is when I usually have dinner. But I'm still so stuffed from lunch because of all this bulk, 
all this nutrient richness now, all the fiber, so on and so forth. Does that make sense? So these things should make it much, much easier to be in a calorie deficit. Okay, a few more tips to help you stay in a calorie deficit before we finish here. Number one, write out a meal plan to give you structure. Some people, like I said earlier, they wake up and they think, right, I want to eat healthy. I want to lose weight. What am I going to eat? And of course, that's step number one, right? I'm glad you're ambitious. But if you don't have a plan, you've just got a dream. And that's all you're left with. You need to take that dream. You need to make it reality. And the way you're going to do that is with structure. Structure is the vehicle through which you're going to execute. It holds you to account. It gives you a framework to manage your behavior by. I'm using lots of lingo here and jargon, but it's basically just a plan, right? You need to know what to do. Okay, you can have it in here, but to have it clearly written out, okay, breakfast, lunch, dinners, here's what I'm going to eat this week. I'm going to have this much variety. Uh, my suggestion is obviously make it a simple plan as well. That's going to make it really easy as you get started. But get your plan of action so you've actually got something anchoring you to this process rather than trying to wing it every day, waking up and thinking, right, I know I've got to eat well today, but what am I going to do? The same goes for exercise. We're talking about nutrition here, but I talked about writing up a meal plan. But the same goes for exercise. Clearly actually plan out over the week. Okay, I've got tennis on Wednesday night like I have today, later on. I've got so-and-so, so-and-so, so -and -so, you know, I'm going to the gym Friday morning. I'm going to do uh, my 5,000 steps on Saturday morning, so on and so forth. Actually have this fairly planned out in your head. You don't need to do everything meticulously, but have a relative rough plan for this um, in your head or on a bit of paper, and it's just going to take your game to the next level. Uh, number three here, let yourself eat out once per week. This might be controversial to some of you. Let yourself eat out once per week so it doesn't feel like a crazy sacrifice. I talked about this in uh, on Instagram recently. One of the big mistakes I made when I first went vegan is I just thought I couldn't eat out. I thought it was going to be too difficult. I didn't want to be the fussy customer, so on and so forth. And to be fair, this was actually at a time where there wasn't actually, you know, this is what, eight years ago. So veganism was starting to boom in the UK. But um but not, not to the amount that it is today. So there just simply wasn't as many options. I could still find stuff in the city I lived in at the time. But I think there was one vegan restaurant, one veggie restaurant, which uh, wasn't bad for a smaller city. But now in the same city, when I went about a year ago, there was about five or six, you know, exclusively vegan places and then a bunch of other veggie, a bunch of other then still very vegan accommodating. Does that make sense? So, yeah, I think for me, looking back, I was probably – so, so neurotic and paranoid about eating out because I was so desperate to lose weight because I was so worried about sort of the vegan thing and will I find good, healthy options. Whereas actually now I think back, I could have eaten out way more than I did and it wouldn't have affected my results. I think the obvious caveat when it comes to eating out and, and the thing that does scare people is because I think generally people generally people understand that you know, with this advice, eat out once per week. When people hear that, they do generally think, oh, that's not too bad once a week. Yeah, that's probably not too bad. If you eat three meals a day, that's one in 21 meals. Okay, that, that could be all right. Surely that won't ruin weight loss progress. When I talk about this, people are like, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Surely, surely that can't take me off track. The problem is the slippery slope. So for some people, they're so used to eating out and they so love the taste of eating out and they so love the convenience of eating out that when they start doing it again, is there the risk of you know, this proverbial sort of slippery slope archetype. And it can happen to folks, but I just think where I've landed on, you know, through my own experience and now helping, what have we done now? 320, 330, 350 probably now, people through Vegan Slim and Sustain over the last three years. I think I've landed on about once a week, seems to strike the balance in lifestyle, in social life, <sighs> with also maintaining decent, solid structure that doesn't risk sort of leaks in the ship or, or this proverbial slippery slope ensuing, about once a week seems to be about the right amount. And that doesn't mean it's not risky. That doesn't mean you can't make a terrible, that you're not likely to make a terrible choice just because you've got a one meal out per week rule. You could still eat something disastrous. You could still then go on and have dessert after, right? The one week, week, one meal out a week rule, it doesn't save you, right? It doesn't guarantee that you'll still make a good choice when you're eating out. But I just think there's something about it. It just seems to strike the right balance between structure and fun and lifestyle without risking if it was two meals out per week, three meals out per week. You can see how this stuff escalates. You're so often introducing oily or more greasy or more calorie rich foods to your palate, to your gut bacteria, to your biochemistry that it's like, uh, I don't know. I don't know. That's to a frequency. That's to a, a frequency and a volume that it would make it a lot easier for this slippery slope to ensue. Blah, 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 blah. I'm going on and on and on. So let's move on from that one. But I think that's really important. Let yourself eat out once a week. It's not going to feel brutal. Don't make the mistake I used to where I was ridiculously strict. And I'm not talking about, you know, doing anything wild. I'm not talking about you necessarily going out and sort of binging on vegan pizza or anything like that. Try and keep it as clean as you can. 
um, you know, from a health perspective, never mind just a weight loss one. But I'm just saying you've got that wiggle room there, right? If you're eating 21 meals a week on a typical three meal structure, one meal is not going to ruin your progress. And it might give you a sense of still feeling human and being able to strike some kind of balance with this. Uh, finally, eat lots of potatoes. I already shared this earlier, so I don't need to repeat. They have incredible intersection between satiation effect, calorie density. Absolutely amazing for you. Um, so that's it. Why are you not losing weight on a vegan diet? Well, firstly, number one, the arrogance and the audacity to assume that being vegan is enough to lose weight. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the really frank way of putting it. And then a level below that is have you actually considered calories? And hopefully now you've got some steps there about if you haven't considered calories before, you've got your MyFitnessPal chronometer three-day experiment that I run you through. If you do understand the importance of calories, well, now it's time to work on actually being able to stay consistently, not just one day of the week, three days of the week, even five days of the week, but consistently in that calorie deficit. So hopefully I've shared lots, lots of actionable tips that will help you with that. A couple of other things though, and this is more mindset related stuff, but let me just pull up my notes here. So here's a couple of other reasons why, or common reasons why people never seem to lose weight. And um, we're not going to talk about calories anymore, but all of these things will affect one's ability to be in a calorie deficit. Again, linking back to what we've talked about so far. Number one is they stay surrounded or you stay surround, you're staying right now surrounded by people that encourage or enable poor lifestyle choices. <sighs> Haven't we all experienced that one, eh? Um, and sadly, this is more easily done in today's culture. Was this a problem 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago? In the Western world, was obesity a problem 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, right? It's so much easier to do now, the enabling, the culture, the consumerism, the level of food consumerism around this stuff. It is just rammed down your face, figuratively and literally speaking. Um, so yeah, be mindful of who you're around. This doesn't mean you need to cut anyone off or be horrible to anyone that doesn't quote unquote get it. But you are going to have to be more conscious of, this, conscious of this stuff. You know, there is this sort of saying in the self-help world, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. That's not literally true, is it? <laughs> right? What? Well, there's some magic number, five people. You could be around five people and still have relatively decent goal. Uh, you know, relative. You could be around five very different people and still have very different goals and actually sustain them. So I've never liked that saying too literally, but I think generally speaking, it's true, isn't it? It's fairly obvious we're social creatures, and if you spend, if you do spend a, a, a large period of time with certain folks, their habits and their thoughts and their belief system will slightly rub off on you. You can be very resilient to that, but it will slightly rub off on you, admittedly. So just be careful of who you're with, and don't be afraid to say no. Are oh, you coming with me, Ra? Are you coming for pizza tonight? Ah, uh, you know what? I'll tell you what. I'll come over, but I'm gonna be I'm gonna be that dork, uh, that geek, and I'm gonna bring my salad, and that's fine. That's absolutely fine. And um, you need to be okay with saying no, with setting boundaries to folks. And it doesn't mean the end of their friendship. And if they are truly friends with you, if they do love you um, unconditionally, they're going to be able to accept you, we would hope, for that. And it's not going to be a deal breaker for them. People do, though, having said that, get very antsy and very personal um, when you don't indulge in their bad habits with them because it sort of allows them a free pass if someone does it with them. So as much as I say the friendship should be fine, you might run into some issues. Um, Another reason, another top reason why people never lose weight, um, they're comfortable and content enough with how they look and feel, that they have little to no driving force to change. And you do need to be frustrated. And pain is a great motivator. And, you know, the, there's this concept, isn't there, of push-pull motivation in the psychological realm. And uh, I do generally agree with this. And I think there's times where you need more push motivation, more pull motivation. Pull being you've got your dream, you've got your idealized future self. And that's compelling enough to want you to move forward uh, with push being I'm so frustrated. I almost feel slightly deficient about where I am right now. And there's some sort of the dark arts in this. This is some stuff that is not pleasant to think about in the old psyche, but it does push you to actually change because you're so frustrated. And some people, they just don't have this. They're overweight. They know they're overweight. And maybe they've tried to lose weight in the past, but they grow comfortable, content and settling enough with how they look and feel that they just don't have that you know, impetus to change. Number three, they have, people have a terrible fear about one whole macronutrient group, usually carbohydrates, <laughs> um, but it's fat in the plant-based community. It's fat, it's the avocados, it's the nuts, the seeds, rightly so oil, but you know, with those whole foods, it's the fat in the plant-based community. And um, people don't realize that it's mostly about the calories as we've talked about so far. Next reason why people never seem to lose weight, they think they can out exercise poor food choices. And by the way, this is technically possible. You can actually do that. I know some folks that do that, but it takes a lot of work to burn off those junk food calories. Much easier to just fix your diet in your first place and eat a little bit better in the first place, I would say. Do both, right? 
do both. Do a bit of exercise as well, obviously. I'm not telling you to eat a plant-based diet and sit on the sofa all day. I don't think that's good for you either. You want to do both. Um, but uh, yeah, this idea of sort of burning off calories, it's just ridiculous. Um, it's just, it's so hard. It, a few poor food choices, and that's going to be a big workout for that day to get you back down to uh, BMR, to maintenance calories. And even then, right, you might have burnt off the calories, but what are the, about the saturated fat you've consumed, the additives, the chemicals, so on and so forth. So from a health perspective as well, of course. Uh, another reason why people don't lose weight, they underestimate the role of habits and therefore experience how much, therefore, excuse me, never experience how much easier this process becomes after they've been consistent for a little while. Isn't that one huge? That one is massive. And I'm constantly telling people, look, you have almost this transitionary period. It's almost a rite of passage where it's hard at first and you've got strong cravings to almost this sort of withdrawal like effect. And you miss up your old foods of the past and you've still got some of the strong feelings and the tendencies and the urges towards the things and the habits, the food habits you used to enjoy in the past, or the alcohol habits you used to enjoy in the past. But trust me, it does get easier through repetition, through consistently, consistency, excuse me. You might need to do some other internal work as well, but simply the process of staying consistent will cure a lot of these problems for yourself because you will start to form new habits and destroy those old habits and forget the old memory patterns of those old habits and basically alter in time your behavior and hopefully your identity your thinking follows but yeah ultimately alter your behavior and once you start changing your behavior there's so much less motivation required willpower required it's amazing how sort of um natural natural weight loss mastery and automated this stuff becomes but i think when people hear this they're kind of slightly slightly apprehensive like ah oh, is it really like that does that really does it really get easier it doesn't always feel like it right when you're in the trenches um but trust me if you can it does uh, another reason why people never seem to lose weight, they're junk food addicts. And even with good knowledge of nutrition, maybe you understand everything I'm talking about today, but that tie, that deeply ingrained habit, that tie, those associations with junk foods, they pull you away from healthy eating after a short time. And similarly, they have been programmed to believe that personal health, or not similarly, actually, excuse me, this is a totally different point. But another reason, final reason here, why people never seem to lose weight. They've been programmed to believe that personal health is a matter of the cards you're dealt, or it's just genetics. And that, you know, diseases are usually random or they're just unfortunate. You're just unlucky to get them. So why even bother, you know, under this idea that maybe you don't even have that much agency over them anyway. And people always reference, well, I knew someone that was really fit and healthy and then they died at 50. You have to understand these people, generally speaking, are exceptions to the rule. And maybe also there was an underlying health problem anyway. So you might think that they were really healthy and fit, but were they truly? Have you seen the blood work, so on and so forth? What else were they dealing with behind closed doors? Um, so yeah, it's when you believe, and this is the level of self-sabotage that can seep into this stuff, when you believe that you don't have that much control or agency over your health, that it is just genetics, or you can be healthy forever or for 50 years and then suddenly get a cancer or a heart disease, so on and so forth. And of course, these things can happen. But generally, that isn't that doesn't tend to be what happens, right? There are risk factors for major chronic disease, and people are through them over time through poor lifestyle choices. And there's a component to the disease, of course, that is disease, uh, that is, excuse me, genetic, where you might argue there is some misfortune or quote unquote luck involved. You might talk about things like gene expression development, so on and so forth. But is that luck or is it genetic? Yeah, it's all mixed in. It's all mixed into one. People can certainly be unfortunate with their conditions or maybe even what they're born with, which could prohibit, uh, you know, making healthier food choices or maintaining weight. However, so there are those people, but again, they're an exception to the rule. And generally speaking, people have a lot more agency, I think, over their health than they realize they actually do. And it isn't just a matter of the cards you're dealt and that you'll be fit and then suddenly you won't be fit. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. There's usually stuff building internally that creates the disease over the long term. And so, um, yeah, I think, isn't that a great excuse, right? If you really believe that it's just genetics or you can't lose weight because your mother had a slow metabolism, well, doesn't that just alleviate any responsibility from you, right? So you have to pick up the mantle and you have to really believe, yeah, I'm in control of this and I can change this and shape this. And that kind of wakes you up a little bit. Is there anything else you'd add to that list? Um, let me know. But yeah, largely talk about calories today, folks. Please address this. And it's, it is an everything, right? I want to finish by saying here that 
as much as I've talked about calories, I've probably said the word calories 50 times in this video. And it even bothers me to say it that much, if you can't tell. It stresses me out to say it that much. Because I don't always like putting so much emphasis on it. But you need to. It's still an important metric of weight loss. Metabolism matters. Metabolic rate. Gut bacteria. Adrenal system. Hormone function by extension. So on and so forth. Stress management. Sleep. Rest. Recovery. Exercise. Obviously. All of these things will make a difference for weight loss. It isn't just calories. And as much as I've talked about calories, I don't believe it's calories in, calories out. I do not believe that all calories are created equal. There's much more nuance to it than that. However, at the same time, calories are still an important metric. And for some reason, in this vegan plant-based space, they get totally, totally ignored. So hopefully this helps. But if you want a little bit more assistance putting it all together, you can check out my Vegan Slim and Sustain program, where I've helped over 220 vegans and plant-based dieters lose at least 20 pounds in their first 12 weeks on the program without counting you'll be happy to hear a single calorie themselves eating simple vegan meals and doing no high intensity workouts just gentle exercise only walking for the first month as well which is really really yeah really really comforting i think for people that are a bit scared uh, about the more intense exercise so just walking for the first month that my clients have to do only so if you want to learn more about that vegan but for now thank you very much for your time see you soon